Hello, everyone. It's 10 o'clock, according to my clock here, and we are happy to welcome you to our latest edition of Encompass Live. This morning, I have uh, Dana Fontaine um, from, where are you? Fremont. That's Fremont. right. Fremont. Mm -hmm. she's, yep. she's from Fremont. And in the studio here, Carla Wendelin is with me, and I'm Sally Snyder. I'll be your host and one of the presenters this morning. We are going to give you a um, a look at a presentation we gave at um, the NLA NSLA conference last month. Was it last month? Already. 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 My time is just ago. zooming by. Mm -hmm. And um, I want you to know that there will be handouts attached to the recorded version of this event. So you can we will get a print copy of our list of titles so you can be sure that the one you're looking at wherever you might be ordering it, if you want to, um, that you have the one that we're talking about. So if you just, if you want to take notes, just jot down a quick note of the title you're after or the author or something, and then you can look at our, our three presentations will be up there. In addition, I'm tacking on my full list of best children's books of 2018 because I told Krista, I'm making a list anyway, so let's put that up there too. So that will be available with this presentation and also on our web page in the presentation section if you're used to going there. Um, no, handouts, excuse me, it's called handouts. Just hunt for the word handouts and my, it's all me because nobody else will put any handouts there. I don't know why. They're welcome to, but they haven't done that yet. So I'm going to, I should say lots of other things like this is recorded for posterity. so. Everyone is welcome to make comments. You can type something into the question section of the uh, GoToWebinar um, list of things up there. Or if you have a microphone, you can just um, say that you want to talk and I will unmute you so you can ask your question online. Uh, just be sure you say good words so that when it's recorded, nobody says, boy, did you hear that? That was bad. Anyway, I'm it's mostly kidding, but let's see if I can get up Dana's handout. That's yours. Wait, where's Dana's? Okay, I'm going to have to activate it again. I don't know what I did with it, so we'll just do another one. There we go. I'm going to make that smaller. And um, this is Dana's presentation. We'll start with you today, Dana. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Dana Fontaine, like Sally said, and I love story time. I'm a high school librarian at Fremont High School, senior high school in Fremont, Nebraska, but I read to the life skills students at my school. And so every other Friday, they, um, they come down to the library and I read them books. And it's probably their favorite favorite time of the week because, you know, they get out of their classroom a little bit and I read them funny, enjoyable books. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is called Are You Scared, Darth Vader by Adam Rex. And this is one of my favorite ones because it's so Funny. A group of wildlings tries to scare Darth Vader, and Darth Vader is nonplussed. He does not care one bit. But then by the end of the book, the children take their masks off, and all of a sudden he's terrified of the children. And so they ask, oh, are you scared of this vampire, Darth Vader? And he goes, no, should I be? And it's great because you can change the voices of each character and it's just hilarious. Okay, this is also like, of course, all of these are my favorites. So I'm just gonna save myself from saying, oh, this is my favorite, this is my favorite. Okay, so What If by Samantha Berger is a beautiful mixed media book about what can happen. Even if you don't have any supplies, you can still create and dream and um, 
and just express yourself in so many ways. So the main character yearns and craves to express herself and she keeps getting her supplies taken away, but nothing will keep her down because she can dance and she can dream and that's all you need to do. It has a wonderful message and a great picture and, and a great, like they call it a gate, but I call it like a, a centerfold type thing that opens up and it's a whole spread of just this beautiful artwork. And Dragons of Tacos and Dragons of Tacos 2 were super funny. So, but I shall warn you that no dragons were harmed in the making of these books. And Dragons of Tacos, but in the second one, all the tacos have disappeared. Where have the tacos gone? So they go in search of their tacos and they think, hmm, what if we went back in time? That's the only thing that we can do. We can go back in time and save the tacos from being extinct. And so without giving them salsa, because if you you know if you if you read the first one, Dragons of Tacos, if you give them salsa, it's bad news bears. So if you read Dragons of Tacos too, just make sure you don't give them salsa and you'll be fine, but you will be doing some time traveling. We Don't Eat Our Classmates stars Penelope, and Penelope is super excited to go to her first day of school because she'll be with other children, and everyone knows that children are delicious. So she is hoping that she will make some friends, but she gets so tempted. She gets so tempted to eat the kids. And so she goes inside and the first thing she does is say, hi, I'm Penelope, but then all the kids are missing because she ate them. And her teacher gets a little upset at her and says, Penelope, we cannot eat our friends. We cannot eat other students. And so it's a pretty diverse book. There's a ton of beautiful diversity in there, so, but she learns by the end that Eating, eating your classmates is not a good way to make friends. And Fiona the Hippo is an adorable book about Fiona and how she be, how she came to be at the Cincinnati Zoo and how she kind of acclimated to her new surroundings. And it's super cute. And it's, it's based on a true story. So, um, and how she acclimated. All right, Carl. Oh, that's <laughs> thanks. Island Born by Juno Diaz is a beautifully illustrated book. It's it's very it's very diverse. A lot of the children's books are becoming more and more diverse, which is wonderful. I love it, and kids like reading about people that look like them. So Lola School is very diverse. Everyone comes from somewhere else, not the in not the United States. Sometimes in the United States, but not in the United States. So Lola is a te Lola's teacher wants them to complete an assignment telling where they're from. And so she doesn't remember where she's from because she was just brought to the United States when she was a baby. And so she goes to her parents and goes to relatives and her neighbors to see, to, for, for them to tell her about her the island she came from. And so it's really interesting all the stories that she learned. Happy Dreamer by Peter Reynolds and The Word Collector by Peter Reynolds. This is just a celebration about dreaming, about how you can dream. This would pair really nicely with What If. And then The Word Collector is Jeremy collects words. He loves to collect words. He collects words wherever he can. And he has books and books and books of words. And sometimes he hangs words up and sometimes he thinks about words. And so it's just a beautiful celebration of that, about finding the perfect word. Creepy Pair of Underwear by Erin Reynolds is about this 
little bunny who wants big boy underwear. And so in order to get those big bo- that big boy underwear, he needs to, or he, he's shopping with his mom and he wants this glow in the dark pair of underwear. And so he buys it. Finally, his mom buys it for him, but then, and he puts it on, but then he can't go to sleep because the creepy pair of underwear is glowing too brightly in the dark. And so he takes it off and puts on regular underwear and puts it in his drawer, but then they come back and he tries to bury them even farther. And then they keep coming back and back and back until he buries them, but then it's too dark. And then he's scared of the dark. And so he goes and digs them up and then he wants to gift them to his friends so that they are not scared of the dark anymore. Dude only has one word in the entire book, which is dude, but it's really fun because you can use tons and tons and tons of voices and expression. And this is a really good way to get your students to use expression when reading. And so I really liked reading this to the students because the illustrations are awesome and it's just a fun book to read. The littlest Viking is very fierce. He gnashes his teeth. He puts up with or he strikes fear into the hearts of his family. But all of a sudden, a warrior princess comes along who's also little and fierce and vocal. And so this is his story of dealing with that and how to deal with a little sister. Rumpy Monkey is a great cautionary tale for your kids who are having a bad day. So at this time, one of my students was having a bad day, and so he was a grumpy monkey. And so we read this story, and it was about a monkey who is grumpy and his friend is trying to cheer him up and he says, why are you grumpy? And he tries to figure out, you know, why are you grumpy? How can I make you not grumpy? And he goes, I'm just grumpy. And so by the end of the book, he becomes less grumpy and it tells how good, how good friendship really can be to make you happy. Esther the Wonder Pig is based on a true story of Esther's two dads and how they came to own a 600 pound pig. Esther, she, she was huge. Esther lives on a farm. She was gifted to these two, she was gifted to these two guys because they thought she was going to be a teacup pig, which they don't get very big. But then all of a sudden she kept growing and growing and growing and they lived in this tiny house. And so then they had to move to another house. Well, then she outgrew that house and she would always open the gate herself and run away. And they loved Esther so much. They did not want to give up Esther. And so they went and bought this farm. And so now they rescue all these animals, but Esther is their star pig and they treat her like they're, that Esther is their baby. And just a bunch of the antics that Esther gets up to, like running over to the neighbors and getting out and running away. This book will not be fun. They're right. This book will not be fun, says the mouse says the mouse who is the star of this book. This book will not be fun until the end. But then as you can see in the background, like it keeps getting crazier and crazier and crazier, kind of like the book with no pictures. So the mouse is kind of grumpy throughout the entire book and people try to make him have fun. But by the end, will he have fun? You're gonna have to read and find out. Wordy Birdie is a great book to share if your class is not listening. Wordy Birdie talks all the time, all the time. She reads signs, she just talks incessantly, but she doesn't really say anything and she doesn't really listen to her friends. And so when you're talking, you need to also listen. 
And so that's what this book is about. Wordy birdie, sometimes talking and sometimes listening is the key to a good friendship. All right. And I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for letting me share those today. Those are wonderful titles. Great fun. Oh, I can get that down there too. Sorry. I'm looking for my next list. Um, this is yours, right? Um, yeah, that's it. From the beginning, let's do that. Okay, next is Carla Wendelin with her presentation of titles. So. Right. When I think of crossovers, I was thinking I'm focusing today on poetry, biography, and a little bit of nonfiction. But I'm thinking about the choices that authors are making uh, in books now. And I'm going to start with poetry. Poetry as nonfiction. Um, I pick, pick poetry to start with because that's probably not always at the top of our list when we're making our book orders each year. So here are some really good choices. A First Book of the Sea, this expansive collection explores the ocean in about 50 poems. The topics are as varied and vast as the ocean itself. In addition to animal and plant poems, subjects include lighthouses, harbors, shipwrecks, pearl divers, and more. The poems are all fairly short, very alliterative, lots of descriptive word choices, full page watercolor illustrations that have an enormous amount of detail. Uh, there is a jaw-dropping gatefold near the end of the book that invites readers to sing like a humpback and proceeds to tell them how. So I think there's no way that kids are not going to want to do that. Uh, great for reading aloud, but it's a book that I think students will return to again and again on their own. In the past, a collection of 20 short poems by uh, David Elliott. These are all prehistoric animals. They begin with the Paleozoic era, era and continues through the Cenozoic era, which is the one we live in right now. Uh, the familiar trilobites are first, uh, and the collection does include the dinosaur superstars like Stegosaurus and Tyrannosaurus rex, but the rest are lesser known animals. Uh, the poems uh, include rhyming and free verse. They're very playful, and each one of them offers a tidbit of information kind of as a teaser to send readers to learn more. The book is large in size, so the full page illustrations in green and gray are massive and highly detailed. Uh, readers are going to absolutely thrill at all the teeth. Um, I want to show you one. I love pop pictures. I love illustrations that make kids gasp. Yes. And this is one of those. That's great. I hope everyone was looking at the yeah. camera of, yeah. of us instead of the um, cover of the book. Um, the back matter contains a substantial amount of detail, uh, lots of facts, and thankfully a pronunciation guide for all of us who never know how to pronounce dinosaur names. Um, this really is an eye-popping blend of science and poetry. A place to start a family. Um, David Harrison has chosen 12 animals and represents birds, mammals, insects, reptiles, fish. Some of them are lesser known to younger readers and describes their home construction in fascinating detail. And when you think people are doing all of this in poetry, it is amazing the amount of detail that you'll find in these. Uh, information on how they build and their materials of choice is woven into verse using a variety of rhyming formats. Uh, the collection is divided according to where they build. Um, additional facts in the back matter, cut paper collage illustrations uh, are crafted from hand painted papers and they have an extraordinary amount of detail, color, texture. This book is another good choice for incorporating poetry into science class. And I think it's the kind of book that will inspire curiosity in readers. Um, I love this one. I, th I was thinking Dana said she loved them all. I should say that too. <laughs> um, begin, beginning with selecting the location, building the nest, laying the eggs. This collection of 16 rhymed poems follows the life cycle of a pair of robins. 
The eggs hatch, the parent robins care for the babies, the fledglings learn to fly, leave the nest, and then the process starts all over again. The rhymes are playful, sprinkled with a lot of alliteration, and I'm on, I'm on, <laughs> I do know how to pronounce this word, <laughs> onomatopoeia. Uh, the bird vocabulary is solid. Uh, vivid language creates delightful imagery, as in when the birds hatch. Pip, pip, an eggshell, chip, peck, peck, a bright blue flap, tweak, tweak, a peeking beak, cracked, all unpacked. <laughs> uh, watercolor and pen and ink illustrations and yummy pastels that look like Easter eggs are Necco wafers, if anybody remembers those, I'm showing my age here, <laughs> reflect considerable humor and a variety of emotions on the faces of, faces of the birds. This book is meant to be read aloud, a good one to pair with Eileen Cristolo's uh, Robins, How They Grow Up. Phrases of the Moon, Lunar Poems by J. Patrick Lewis. Uh, this is a collection of 18 poems that celebrate our perpetual fascination with the moon. Though most of the poems rhyme, a variety of poetic forms explores the whimsy of the moon, such as comparing it to a hang hanging lamp or its effect on sandcastles or imagining driving to the moon. One poem charts names of the moon across cultures. Another one plays with language as in moonograms, which are anagrams. Five of the poems are retelling of myths, myths from different cultures. Uh, the, bo the book does contain a selection of moon facts. This will be great next summer when, with summer reading and when we're celebrating the anniversary, 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. You really can't go wrong with this. It's a companion to the book that J. Patrick Lewis edited, the one on animal poetry, another one on nature poetry, the ones published by National Geographic with their magnificent photographs. If you have the other two, then you are for sure going to want this one. Uh, this volume is divided into seven regions of the United States and includes the territories. How often do you find the territories included? Um, classic poets such as Whitman, Frost, Langston Hughes are included along with the who's who of contemporary children's poets. Um, the poems deal with specific places, events, and nature in the area. This is a gem. Uh, the photos themselves will leave readers in awe. It's worth the, the cost of the books, which is about $25 or so. Every Month is a New Year by Marilyn Singer. Um, sandwiched in between the opening and the closing, closing reverso poems, which is one of her signature styles, uh, that deal with choosing a date for the turning of the year are 16 rhymed and free verse poems set in various world cultures. I'm going to give you a look at how this book is set up because it reads this way, like the turning of a calendar. Um, it starts with the ball drop in New York City. It's Times Square and embarks on a journey that includes many countries around the world, Scotland, Russia, Iran, Thailand, Jordan, and so on. Um, each poem contains details about the traditional foods and customs of the celebration. There is a map of the world at the beginning of the book. Extensive back matter it includes the history of calendars, a pronunciation key for Happy New Year in several languages, substantive detail on each of the celebrations, a glossy, Glossary, a pronunciation guide for non-English words. These stunning textured collage illustration created with papers collected from all over the world uh, reflect the color clothing and settings in the different cultures. It's informative and fascinating. Have you heard, have you heard about Lady Bird? This is a companion title to singers Rutherford B. Who is he? Poems about the presidents. In this one, each of our first ladies, all the way through Melania Trump, is encapsulated in a poem. The poetry formats vary, but most of them are rhyming. Each poem addresses the woman according to her individual interests and includes ways in which she supported her husband, thus establishing her own place in history. A timeline makes up the closing end papers and biographical sketches of each first lady is included in the back matter along with a list of books and websites. 
this is a useful introduction that I think will lead readers to additional sources. Countdown, 2,979 days to the moon. This is a bit for a bit older student, a uh, free verse narrative about the Apollo program. It begins with Apollo 1, which was the ill-fated mission that killed astronauts Gus Chris and Roger Chaffee and Ed White in a flash fire in the space capsule during testing. The triumphs, pitfalls, and people of the next missions are included, culminating in the flight of Apollo 11 to the moon in 1969. Vivid use of language. She builds suspense. The white space of the verse novel format is appealing to students. Superb, highly detailed pastel and watercolor illustrations supplemented with archival photographs from NASA. This unique book is also an obvious choice for summer reading next year and the celebration of Apollo 11. I'll say just a few things about this one. Both animal and in city poems of urban wildlife, both animal and plant poems, elements of facts are woven into the poems. Um, this is the kind of book that lets readers know that there's more nature to, the, to a city environment than it may seem. Earthverse, Haiku from the Ground Up by Sally Walker. In 29 Haiku, the author describes aspects of the Earth's physical geography, including rocks and minerals, fossils, volcanoes, icebergs, glaciers, earthquakes, and much more. The poems don't shy away from technical vocabulary, yet the vivid word choices make the science relatable to readers who have some familiarity with these geologic concepts. For example, a volcano is described in the haiku. Hot-headed mountain loses its cool, spews ash cloud, igneous tantrum. <laughs> and comparing Earth's composition to a hard-boiled egg requires some, inspires some reflection. While this book really is lovely to look at, the impressionistic colored pencil illustrations don't do a whole lot to ex extend the concepts but there is extensive additional information appended. Okay, let's look at some biographies. Um, I think a lot of people are using almost poetic elements in biography these days. And as you know, biography is an exploding area of children's literature. Um, I heard a remark by a literary agent who handles children's authors and she said that she'd like to receive biographical manuscripts about lesser known accomplished women and actually i think she's getting her wish based on bi bios published in the past few years uh, someone like grace there's a biography of grace hopper who developed computer code there are four picture books since, since 2015 about ada byron loveless whose specialty was computer programming. Um, Margaret Hamilton, who wrote Code for Computers in the Apollo Mission. Marie Tharp, who mapped the ocean floor. Eugenie Clark, a shark scientist, um, to name a few. Um, we noticed media influences, like after the movie Hidden Figures, Katherine Johnson, there's a picture book about her, and also a picture book about the hidden figures. Politics. Uh, three picture books about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one published in 2016, 17, and 18. Uh, three books about Sonia Sotomayor, um, Barbara Jordan, a new book coming about Barbara Jordan. Um, world figures, we have lots and lots of books about Malala Yousafzai. Uh, and some that strike me as unusual subjects for the picture book audience. A picture book about Audrey Hepburn, Two picture books about Jane Austen from January of 2018. A picture book about Gloria Steinem, Coco Chanel, and Elsa, Elsa Scaparelli. Two designers, which lets us know there's something for everyone. The new picture book about Hyper, Harper Lee. And men are also getting into the action. A pic, new picture book about Neil deGrasse Tyson, my favorite. Um, I have a crush on Neil deGrasse Tyson, I admit that. Carlos Santana, two books about Carlos Santana in 2018. And then we have some new books coming. And there's a new book about Walt Disney. Um, one of Doreen Rappaport's biographies where the whole cover is the photo and the uh, information is on the back cover. Uh, another new, Troy Andrews, uh, also known as Trombone and Shorty, has written the second book, um, also illustrated by Byron Collier. 
Um, Madhira is some, another one of the women who we might not know too much about until this book. Uh, Sophie Germain uh, was a young woman who lived at the time of the French Revolution, and she had a gift for math, complex mathematical concepts. Um, in the book, it's easy to see how she persevered given the time in when she lived, and submitted her work to scholarly organizations with a male pseudonym. The fact that we have structures such as bridges, skyscrapers, and the Eiffel Tower can be traced back to Sophie's work. Game Changers, the story of Venus and Serena Williams. Uh, it starts with in their childhood when every morning they swept the trash and the broken glass from the rather worn out neighborhood tennis court before they could play. It follows the two of them up to the present day. The themes in this book, hardworking, goal-oriented, ambitious, competitive, quite a bit of text, probably has more appeal for third to fifth grade. Um, another picture book about the Williams sisters came out this summer, Sisters and Champions, similar content, but this second book takes more of a story approach. You could probably drop that one down to second or even first grade. And what surprises me about both of these books is that there weren't more illustrated picture book biographies about these two before now. Um, I don't think you'll ever find this in biographies, but I included it because it is a prime example of the almost poetic writing that we're finding in some of these. This is just a slice of life, um, what writing teachers in kindergarten might call a small moment. Um, and the life of the Chilean poet, Pablo uh, Neruda. Uh, I'm not sure all of our students out there will ever come in contact with Pablo Neruda. That is a shame. Um, I will ever read his poetry, but I'm showing you an example of the writing. Uh, it's interesting that at the front of the book, this paper almost looks like an onion skin. But the text will give you an idea of what I'm talking about in finding here that we're finding in some of these books. I'll read just a snippet. Pablo is hard at work writing a long, sad poem. His pen whirled, the pages piled high. The clock struck 12. Pablo jumped. He was going to be late for lunch with his friend Matilda. He combed his hair and wished he didn't look so gloomy. Matilda liked to laugh. She had a smile as wide as a guitar. Pablo tried to hide his gloom expression behind a bouquet of puppies. No time for sadness, Matilda said as she filled a vase with water. Come, I need your help with lunch. Matilda led Pablo to where fennel grew among tomato bushes. The air smelled like licorice and mud. Wow. That makes you want to read on. <laughs> and maybe sample his poetry. Um, How to Build a Hug, Temple Grand and Her Amazing Squeeze Machine. This book starts out this way and sets the tone, I think, for the entire book. Temple loved folding paper kites, making obstacle courses for her dog, and building lean-tos with real hinged doors. Temple did not like scratchy socks, whistling tea kettles, bright lights, or smelly perfumes. And Temple really didn't like hugs. So this book deals with her childhood into her young adult years and discusses issues related to her autism, her creativity and problem solving abilities, including building something that would make her comfortable receiving a hug. This is a very child friendly story and an introduction to an accomplished woman. Well, it was just a matter of time before we started having books about Eliza Hamilton. Um, <laughs> this one is written in first person as if it's a letter from Eliza to her unborn great granddaughter, dated 1854. She died later that year at the age of 97. So it is a birth to death that is the end of the letter. Very straightforward narration, frequently praising her husband's accomplishments and discussing how she spent her life after his death, which in itself was truly remarkable. She mentions that she and Alexander weathered a scandal and in the back matter, it does mention his affair and mourned their firstborn without saying that he also died in a duel 
though that's in the back matter. Eliza was important as a founding mother and a worthy subject for students to know. Definitely a book for classes studying the American Revolution. The Golden Thread, A Song for Pete Seeger. With four, bio pub four biographies published since his death in 2014, this one is the most recent. Might not be a household name for kids, but songs like If I Had a Hammer and Where Have All the Flowers Gone might strike a chord for some, though they would not likely know that he wrote them, as well as the arrangement of We Shall Overcome, which we, which we sing now. Very rhythmic rhyming text tells his story, his life story, almost as if it were a song. His activism for civil rights, his anti-war activities, his concern for the environment are all covered, as well as his blacklisting during the McCarthy era. Striking illustrations, meant to be read aloud, especially paired with his music. I'm not sure you're going to be able to see very particularly well this illustration that I'd like to show. It's actually uh, it's the, I'll tell you the text. It's the illustration that goes on the front. It says, I heard there was a golden thread, a shining magic thing that bounded up our little world. I heard Pete Seeger sing. Pete Seeger sing. When I looked at this illustration, I was immediately a little bit troubled by it. Um, I showed it to my husband and I said, what's wrong with this picture? And he looked at it and he said, he's not singing a Pete Seeger song. He's singing, this land is your land, this land is my land. Right, that's a Woody yeah. Guthrie song. With all of yeah. Pete, Pete, Pete Seeger's famous songs, I think they should have put, I had, if I had a hammer or something there, but that's a kind, that's an interesting kind of thing. Kids are going, not probably going to notice that, but you can talk about that a little bit. Um, critical evaluation of the illustrations. Dreamers, this is not going to be categorized as a biography. I include it because of the autobiographical piece at the end. It is touching and would make an excellent, make an excellent read aloud on its own. Uh, this is Morales' story <coughs> of how she brought her two-month-old son from Mexico to the United States. And she writes of how discovering the public library changed their lives. A very spare text, beautifully illustrated, a message for every reader. I think this one's a must to own. So Tall Within, Sojourner Truths, Long Walk to Freedom. The, the book is a very long, a very tall size. Um, we love Gary Schmidt for his wonderful Newberry Honor books, Lizzie Bright and the Buckminster Boy and the Wednesday Wars. This beautifully written biography tells Isabella's story of strength and persistence from the time she was a child through her life as Sojourner. It's organized into sections that begin with words that can only be described as poetry. For example, in slavery time, when respect fell as often as snow in July, Dr. D Mr. Dumont ordered Isabella to marry a slave named Thomas. She had five children. Uh, so it, that poetic piece is followed by information about her life. There are really a number of biographies about Sojourner Truth, but I recommend this one to you if you're looking for a new one. Spring After Spring, How Rachel Carson Inspired the Environmental Movement. Once again, the very beginning of this book sets the tone for the audience. It was dawn when the chorus began. Rachel didn't want to miss a note. And the illustrations reflect a lot of little birds singing their sounds. As the midday sun warmed the earth, other musicians chimed in. Life and music were all around, and wonders big and small. Spring was Rachel's favorite time of the year. Um, so we see immediately, it's a story that's very readable for young readers. It does deal with her work as a writer and the research that she had to do to write her books. It's another story that reflects a lot of commitment and determination. The back matter gives us more to share with kids. Perfect for Earth Day or any day. Like many of the others I've reviewed here, it's consistent with STEM objectives. Turning pages, my life story. This one is by Soto, Sonia Sotomayor. We don't have a ton of autobiographies to share with kids, um, though there are a couple of other biographies about her for young people. She opens with, my story is a story about books. 
and proceeds to tell how, like a puzzle, she pieced together the parts of her life through the power of words. Beginning with her childhood and taking readers to the Supreme Court, she goes through each of the parts of her story and concludes the individual sections with a statement of how books helped her get there. Quite a bit of text in this one, but the story is well organized and not difficult at all to read. It is a testament to the influence of books and reading on one's life. Uh, the end papers can paint, contain photographs. Also very topical. Um, Elizabeth Warren, nevertheless, she persisted. Um, very straightforward biography that begins in her childhood. The theme appears to be an explanation of why she now supports the issues that she does, rights and fairness for middle-class Americans. She started out as a teacher with, of children with special needs, then went to law school, as is the case of many of the uh, women who went on into law and politics. No one would hire a woman, but she persisted and started out of her home. The book does include the famous Mitch McConnell, though referred to in the text as, quote, another senator, incident when she wanted to read the letter from Coretta Scott King at the Jeff Sessions hearings. Hence, the pers she persisted in the title. Um, all of these biographies have differing amounts of back matter. There are some timelines, there are quotes, always additional information and resources. So are the kind of books that can be springboards, I think, to kids for other things. Just a little bit of narrative nonfiction, nonfiction that um, tells a story. A lot of people object to cataloging this as nonfiction, but I think some of these books really blur the lines. I particularly love this one. I loved her book, Coyote Moon. Um, a young girl watches the daily activities of a hawk in a text that embeds information about hawks in beautiful language that reads like a long poem. Gorgeous illustrations, good read aloud. Facts in the back matter about red-tailed hawks. We have so many red-tailed hawks in Nebraska, it makes this book a really good purchase for your collection. Go Show the World, a celebration of indigenous heroes. This is an overview of 14 famous Canadian and American Indians of the past and present, all of whom are accomplished in different ways. Uh, rather uneven rhyming lines introduce each one. It is, they are not chronologically organized, um, but small biographical profiles and a sketch of each of the subjects is in the back of the book that includes the dates in which they live. Not much specific information in the rhymes, which might require readers to flip back and forth to the profiles. The book has flaws, but if you need something, you might take a look at this one. Uh, the recurring refrain throughout is, Quote, you are people who matter. Yes, it's true. Now go show the world what people who matter can do. Love Agnes, Postcards from an Octopus. It's a very unique way of presenting information. The postcards to and from the octopus by other ocean animals and a child who started the correspondence. In between the postcards, we see Agnes's activities, which include looking for a home, hunting for food, laying eggs. Not a lot of text, eye-catching illustrations, additional facts, further reading, and websites in the back matter. Who would think there would be two fabulous new books about octop octopuses? Yay. This one's by Cy Montgomery, whose nonfiction is exceptional. Uh, this is based on an actual octopus. It tells a story about his life in the sea and how he was caught in a lobsterman's trap and later taken to an aquarium. Kids will love learning that Inky, Inky, Inky's amazing escape, that love learning that Inky liked to play with Legos and Mr. Potato Head that they put in his tank. He later escaped back to the Pacific Ocean. Very colorful collage illustrations, back matter with more information and fun fact, facts about octopuses. And I guess that really is the way you say it, octopuses, not octopi. Mm -hmm. Hush up and hibernate. <laughs> you will never find this cataloged as nonfiction. A mother bear tries to prepare her cub for hibernation, but he continues to make excuses for why he doesn't want to go. Perfect for preschool story hours and kindergarten. Teaches hibernation within the context of an appealing story. Hibernation facts in the back. And I'm going to use a word to describe this book that I have never in my life used in book reviews. Adorable. <laughs> 
wild orca, the oldest, wisest whale in the world, also based on an actual animal, a 105-year-old orca called Granny. Like some of the others I've talked about, the story frame is about a little girl and her family hoping to see a particular group of orcas, Granny's families that have been identified by scientists. Woven into the story are large sections of information about orchids in general, map on the end papers, facts about Granny and the orcas, orcas magnificent illustrations by Wendell Miner. And that's it for me. Thank you. Wow. And it looks like we have a question, or is that just my question from before? I'm just seeing your question okay. about, about you being online. Oh, okay, gotcha. Another one. But thank you, because I've been trying to watch, but sometimes I forget. I'm busy listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's end that show. And we'll see if my list is available. Maybe yes. Why doesn't it show me? Let's just do this. Okay. Why does it say October? Oh, that's because it was a conference. Oh, I feel better already. I got worried. Yeah. I'm going to talk about novels for, um, I like to call it upper elementary. You know, my terminology is old. Everybody uses this term middle grade, which drives me crazy because oh, I have no idea what age group they're really talking about. I think it's so vague. Anyway, I don't like that term. Okay, so I'll calm down now. So I'm just going to be, you know, specific and say upper elementary. Not, well, I start with uh, one that could be considered an early chapter book, except it doesn't have chapters. But it's kind of like an early chapter book. This is a full color graphic novel that will serve well in that early chapter book area. Peter and Ernesto are sloths and good friends, but Peter wants to leave their tree, but Peter never wants to leave their tree and Ernesto longs to travel. Eventually uh, Ernesto leaves and has amazing adventures. Periodically the story returns to Peter who finally decides he must follow Ernesto to be sure he is all right and bring him back to the tree. They each have adventures and eventually find each other again. It's a good friendship story, more than just the two sloths. There are some other friendships that develop. And also accepting that someone else has different goals or desires than you do. And it's just fun. Oh, by the way, I love all these books. <laughs> They're all my favorites, like everybody else. For some reason, my, my more calm yellow background went crazy here. Maybe it's okay. I guess it's okay on the um, on this recording, so I, I won't stop worrying about it. I love this because this is book one about Og the Frog, and it it takes you back to the first book about Humphrey. And the and this, but this now we know what Og the Frog was thinking. It's so wonderful. Og, the green frog, tells of his time first in room 27 next to George, a bullfrog who was not happy that Og was there. And that's how he ended up in room 26 next to Humphrey's cage. Readers will enjoy finding out Og's point of view and opinions about what goes on in the classroom. And they'll think back to the first book about Humphrey. Og writes poems and songs and his mantra is, float, doze, be. This is the first book in what uh, I understand is going to be a series, so there'll be more than one about him, so keep your eye out for more about Og the Frog. So would you recommend reading Og the Frog first or Humphrey first, if you've never read the Humphrey series? I guess, I guess right now I'd recommend reading Humphrey first because I thought back, how long ago did I read Humphrey? How many, don't, let's don't talk about years. <laughs> Several years ago, I read hum, the first Humphrey book. And so when I was reading this, I was going, oh yeah, I remember that. Oh, did that happen in Humphrey? So um, I think if kids want to read Humphrey and Og together, it might not matter which one they read first, but of course, because Humphrey's very solidly in my head, I would start with him myself. But May it be fun to have kids start with Og and then read Humphrey. That's a good question. This is a full color graphic novel. Sparks the dog is in the news frequently as he often saves the day. 
But the truth is, he is a, ro a robot, and inside him are two cats, Charlie and August. August refuses to go outside. It's too dangerous, except when he's in the robotic dog suit. He invented it, and Charlie pilots it. But now they must face an alien who looks like a little baby, who is intent on taking over the world. Charlie and August must do all they can to overwhelm the princess. Oh, it could be tough work. This is a black and white and olive green graphic novel memoir, graphic novel style memoir. This is a fictionalization of the author's experience feeling out of place with the girls at school and then with the girls at camp. Her mom is divorced and cannot afford to send her to the expensive camp all the girls at school attend. But with their Russian heritage, she and her younger brother can attend the ORA, O-R-R-A, Organization of Russian Razvichiki in America, a camp with the usual activities, plus speaking Russian all the time, and where she once again feels out of place. She is miserable, the bathroom, oh, let's not even talk about that. She is put in a tent with two older girls who think she is a baby. They are 14 and she is almost 10. So that was a bad pairing of age groups. Over time, she makes a couple of connections and finds a friend and realizes camp had a lot to offer her. There's empathy for others and seeing through the bullies and really finding herself and, and who she wants to be. Oh, I love oddity. Oddity, New Mexico is an unusual town. To 11-year-old Ada, everything is normal. Zombie rabbits, not really zombies and not really rabbits, but they cause trouble regularly. Aliens, puppet beings, you know, normal stuff, everyday stuff. But to newcomer Caden from Chicago, this town is weird. Ada is determined to find out what happened to her twin, Pearl, after she was one of the winners of the annual sweepstakes. They disappear every year, and someone must know something. It's a bit creepy, humorous, with kids determined to save their town. I hope there's a sequel to this one, oh. to the Oddity one. Oh, to Oddity. That would be great if there was a sequel. Let's write to the author and suggest it. Yes. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on board with that one. This is the first of the Rick Riordan Presents titles. This one is based on Hindu mythology. Aru, who is 12, lives with her mother at the Museum of Ancient Indian Art and Culture in Atlanta, Georgia. Her mother has often gone on trips to research and discover artifacts for the museum. At the beginning of winter break, three schoolmates stop by to challenge Aru to prove one of her stories is true. She has a good imagination and some of the things she's heard about the artifacts make good stories, but she wasn't really telling the truth. This prompts her to light the lamp that could end the world. You should never light the lamp that could end the world. Um, but anyway, soon Aru and her fellow heroine Minnie are traveling to mystical places to try and save the world. Wonderful action working through a possible friendship with Minnie and dealing with the guilt she feels keeps Aru on her toes. There's going to be another book in this series for sure. I don't know if there's going to be more than one more. I guess we'll see how it how it evolves, but it's a, it was a wonderful, well-written story of a culture that I'm not very familiar with. Stella, eight and then nine, is in third grade. She loves all kinds of fish, especially her pet beta fish, Pancho. Her best friend, Jenny, is in the other third grade class, and Stella is worried that she will make new friends and forget about her. She is shy about speaking in school because sometimes Spanish words come out instead of English. When a new student, Stanley, joins their class, she says, me amo Stella, and then avoids him in embarrassment because that was Spanish. Since the students are expected to give an oral presentation of their chosen research topic, and some of the girls are beginning to pick on her, eventually Stella begins to work on speaking up. A sensitive look at shyness, fitting in, and speaking up. Also, Stella discovers that she and her family are aliens with green cards, legally living in the United States, which feels weird to her at first because she didn't feel like she was an alien. And she has to work through that too. The Magic Misfits, this is a 2019-2020 Golden Sower Chapter Books nominee. Um, Carter, who's about 12 or so, runs away from his uncle. Carter enjoys sharing his card tricks and other illusions with strangers, but he never has and never will 
steal anything from anyone. His uncle insists on it. Carter arrives hungry and broke in Mineral Wells, a New England town. He accidentally encounters Mr. Vernon, who runs a magic shop, and soon has made friends with his daughter and several other youth who all enjoy magic. They all soon realize that B.B. Basso, a carnival owner, is up to no good and needs to be stopped. Soon they all embark on a plan that may stop him or may get them all in big trouble. The six kids and Mr. Vernon use teamwork, illusion, and magic to try to win the day. And this is the first book in a new series. It includes occasional illustrations throughout the book. And as you can tell, it's by the um, actor Neil Patrick Harris. Michaela is 13 and she does love Double Dutch and her team could win it all this summer. Then her parents, who must work on their marriage, send Michaela and her younger brother Cameron from their home in Brooklyn to their aunt and uncle's house in South Carolina. Michaela and her cousin Sally have been on the outs for a while and things don't look like they're going to get better. They are sent to a day camp and Michaela is thrilled that there is a double Dutch, comp double Dutch competition. But first she has to talk Sally into being on her team and then they have to find two more people. They have to have four. Can they compete with two rookies? This is a good look at doing what you love, finding some people who might be interested in it and helping them understand how it works so that they can uh, do the best they can with this initial competition. Family, bullying, and competition stress are addressed in this novel. Another full color graphic novel, New teacher Mr. Wolf, ha Wolf has high hopes for his fourth grade class and greets the students as they arrive. This is really just the first day of school, this whole book. All the characters are portrayed as animals and there is diversity among them. During the first day of school, the reader and the class learn that each of them have different expectations and home situations that come to the front at school. For example, one student goes missing. She has a new baby brother and she's fallen asleep in a box because she just doesn't get any rest at home much to Mr. Wolf's concern. I think there's going to be more books in this series too, because we have plenty more days of school to find out what else is going on with the kids. This is the sequel to Weekends with Max and his dad. Max is still in third grade and he and his mom are headed for a family reunion for his great, great aunt's 100th birthday party. And they're going on a road trip to get there. Max is worried about his dad, who was supposed to have Max on the weekends. Will his dad be all right without him? They're going to be gone for a little while. He is also worried about the tall roller coaster his mom is looking forward to. He's not sure he can handle riding that. And there are many cousins to meet and get to know. It is a bit stressful, but they all turn out to have a good time. And this also has um, occasional um, illustrations through the story to break up the text. This is set in the 1990s. Two years ago, Mia, now 10, and her parents moved from China to the US as legal immigrants. Finding jobs was hard, but then they agreed to be the managers of a somewhat rundown motel. It sounded good when they signed the papers, but the owner pulled a bait and switch on them, and they are hard pressed to do all the work and are making very little money. They live at the motel in a cramped space. Mia runs the desk for them when she is not in school, and she learns quite a bit along the way. Her parents begin to let other Asian, mostly Chinese immigrants who have been treated poorly too, stay overnight for free. One of the book reviews said they were smuggling them, which is, I think that's misleading. It isn't that they were smuggling them any, anywhere, they were just letting them stay in the hotel for free and then they did all the cleanup afterwards and didn't, didn't tell the owner that they had been there, which is actually not legal. I mean, they were not keeping up their end of the bargain, but they understood this bad situation that other people were in too. Equality, ideals, and human rights are addressed and also forgiveness. This has got a starred review in School Library Journal and Kirkus. And I think this is a great book, even though it might be a tad unrealistic at the end, it does have a heartwarming, happy ending. So thank you. That's my list. I was really, I think everybody felt this way, but it was really, really hard to cut yeah. it down to the number of titles we all um, came up with because there are so many wonderful books. 
Did you want to say something, Dana? Are you sure. Yeah, there, I was agreeing with you. Yes, it's most stuff. It was so hard to cut it down. But, but these are the ones that we end up talking about, and I think we have a great list of titles, picture books, nonfiction of various, um, what do I want to say, groupings, I guess, <laughs> and some, some uh, novels for upper elementary age. And um, I don't see any questions here, uh, any comments from anyone. Now's the time to type it into the question area or say that you want to use your microphone to talk with us. Again, um, this this is being recorded and it will be available. So if you want to go back and look through a certain part and say, what did Carla say about the Wild Orca book? I can't remember. You can do that. Um, we will have our book lists up, as I said before. And also, I'm going to attach my longer overall book list. You might notice some overlap between Dana's list and mine. And not as much overlap with you, but there's a couple of books there I want to put on my summer reading program list now that you've talked about it, if I can find a copy to, to, to I, read. Oh. I second front desk. I don't think it's smuggling. I think it's maybe harboring. I don't know if it's smuggling, but I loved front desk as well. I agreed with Sally's list a lot. And the, the girl is... 10 and but she she can read people she learns how to read people from working at the front desk all that time and she's i don't think that's unrealistic at all i think that kids who deal with a lot of people uh, the different kinds of people who come by a, a not so great motel you can learn to read a lot of what you might be expecting well thank you dana thank you carla for both the the Nebraska Library Association, Nebraska School Librarians Association conference event, and today I really appreciate you coming in in person or via the yeah. um, go to webinar in order to give this um, presentation. And I invite everyone to look on our list on our Encompass Live part of the um, Nebraska Library Commission webpage to see what else is coming up next week and the weeks beyond. Um, Jill Annis and I will be giving a presentation on our teen books that we talked about at conference. I added a couple in online because, <laughs> you know, that's the nice thing about doing this a little bit later is there's a couple more books you've read. You can slip it in on the yeah. list. So why not? That'll be, I think it is December 5th or something. So look for that. And um, thank you so much, everyone. And um, this ends our presentation. Thanks, guys. Thank you.